welcome to this morning's meeting of the Infrastructure Committee. We have a quorum, and um, I'm not sure we have any apologies other than Dolores isn't here, but I believe that she'll be she'll be long in due course. Um, today we will be receiving a briefing from Northern Ireland Water, and we'll also be considering a number of pieces of subordinate legislation. Um, and no apologies, um, Chairperson's business. Uh, if you look at page five of your packs, we have the um, strategic planning meeting um, detailed as to um, what we want to do over the, over the next number of months. Are members content with that, that list and that document? Yep, okay. Same. Thank you. Um, I don't have any other items of business other than just wanted to maybe make reference to the urgent oral question yesterday and um, the issue around how we receive information as we did. Um, I think I know the minister probably felt that she had done, went through sort of appropriate measures, but I think given the scale of the decision that was being made and the fact that she recognised herself that this was a substantial decision that had been that had been long awaited, that you know it might be right. That we perhaps ask um, if she would do, if she would make or make announcements such as that by a written statement. Um, she may not want to do an oral statement, but certainly able something like that in the, in the future, particularly given the the scale of the of the announcement. I know that there will be other decisions which will be made, which may not have um, the same impact. But certainly, something like that does, and we know that of other um, decisions which will be coming down the line. Um, so I know, obviously, um, I think maybe some bad practices um, might have crept in uh, during the time when we were in the height of COVID. Um, obviously, the fast tracking of announcements and that was all necessary at that time. And perhaps I, I can only maybe um, excuse what happened because maybe it was just part of how things had been done uh, so many months ago. That's not. Uh, to give any justification for it. So I thought you were right in, in how you handled it um, on the floor. And I think you're, you are right to say that announcements are serious as that. Given that all of us, uh, we all as MLAs have raised it, we've presented cases, we've put in questions, we've questioned the minister. So she would have known it was an issue that we would have needed to be informed about. And we should have been informed about that in a better way. <coughs> I very much appreciate that she was reflected back on what had been done maybe by previous ministers as well. But just because that was done in the past doesn't necessarily mean it was right either. Right then, yeah. then yeah. Um, And I just think given the strategic importance of some of the announcements which are being made, it, it, it might be appropriate. Um, not in all cases, but certainly in cases such as that, that um, we do receive more information, Mr. Boylan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. No, I agree with that approach. I mean, Chair, this was a major, this is a major infrastructural decision made yesterday. I mean, this is dating way back to 2007. And mm -hmm. I appreciate comments from members as to whether they're for it, against it, or not. I mean, the reason why I put it in, there's six and a half thousand objections mm -hmm. this year, and this is a major, major piece. So. I mean, I, I, at the very least, even come to the committee and say, no, I, I think the minister should have been actually come to the chamber anyway to, to announce a major infrastructural change like that there. Because this, this affects the whole island, never mind the northern part of the island, it affects the whole. Like this, you know, so, I mean, it's, it was part of a European directive and part of an all island uh, energy market project from the very, very start. And I know that some members may, like I say, there's members here who haven't been here from the start of the program. But I'm here from the start of the process, and I mean, I thought announcing that like that there just was wrong. And I mean, I said here before, uh, the minister come here before, and we're a scrutiny committee, but still, we want to work with the minister to try and encourage development as well. I mean, it, it's, it, it works both ways. So I, I would have thought that I would have liked the opportunity for it to have a, and like you say, written statement certainly, but, but a chance either through the committee or through the floor of the house to have a discussion about it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think from the evidence yesterday, it was very clear that due procedure was followed. A decision notice was issued in line with the way all decision notices have been issued in the past by previous ministers. Um, I think a uh, requirement for if a minister makes a determination on a plan application, it should come to the chamber and explain that would be a real departure from what due process has been in the past. 
um, so I do not think that would be appropriate. If there is a feeling that it should be issued as a written statement, um, so essentially the, written notice, the decision notice is issued alongside an explanatory note in terms of a written statement, that is something obviously we need to discuss, but we also need to bear in mind the integrity of the planning process and how the decision-making process occurs around that, and uh, I think it is important to respect that. No, and I, and I don't. I don't necessarily disagree with that either. But I do think that there are instances where, if something is of strategic importance, and mm. you know, I think it should be shared in a, in a different manner. And I don't think any of us should be asking a written statement on every sort of housing development, large housing development that's passed. I don't. I don't want. Um, that's not where I'm taking this at all. But I do think that where there's something as significant as that. <coughs> That it should have been delivered perhaps in a different way and it's maybe just i mean i appreciate that that's how it was done in the past um, and obviously that was the advice that the minister was given um, and i'm not going to question that either but it maybe just it, there is a, a chance perhaps for her to to reflect and, and maybe have a, a different practice particularly around s certain applications that perhaps maybe need to have a different um, delivery mechanism to be fair chair all the applications are significant because they are regionally significant applications. So then, how are we going to ask the minister to determine what she does and what she doesn't? You know, um, so there is a clear departure from the way applications have been de de determined by previous ministers here. Just because something was done in the past doesn't make yeah. in that particular way makes it right either. You know, so I suppose maybe it's just an opportunity for maybe we do write to her just to ask for her to consider a different way of, of delivering the message. Mr. Beggs. Uh, I think um, if things are going to be done differently, we would want it to occur, a better chance of it occurring if it was something that applied to every department. Yeah. So perhaps you could take the issue to the Chairperson's Liaison Committee, because um, we represent um, uh, a wide variety of political parties, and no doubt there are members of our parties who are also ministers. And so therefore, uh, if there was a collective change that could be agreed, that would be much better. Yeah, I would, I would disagree with Andrew in that whilst every application is important, of course, crucially important to the applicant that's putting it in, um, this particular application had 6,500 objections. So it has been um, on the cards for a long time. And, and therefore, I do think what's significant <coughs> and potentially controversial um, in relation to an announcement like that should at least she has a right to make the announcement as a minister, whatever one thinks of that announcement, we can all go through whatever challenges or the public can challenge that. But she should, in respect to the members of this committee and the MLAs, um, when it's of that scale and has been receiving that kind of attention, then I think it is only appropriate that it is a statement in the Assembly, but maybe, as has been said, the chairs should discuss that as to how we as MLAs are in receipt of decisions that are made. Okay. So agree with Roy. Yeah. Roy. Roy's proposal is something I would agree with. If we take out the chairperson's liaison. Because that's something that would go to chairperson's liaison. <sighs> Not really. Not really. I can't support the proposal that has been originally outlined. That there has to be a statement. In well, I'm not saying that there has to be a statement, but, but maybe what we do is we write to her to ask about maybe exploring other ways of delivering um, announcements such as these in order for to to sort of give timely notice and so on as well. Just to, I'm sure you, I'm not asking the committee to do this, but I mean for people just to reflect. I mean, even in my time here, come back to significant decisions being made. Most of the significant ones either come through program for government or executive decisions. For for a minister to make a decision like this, you, you may find, and I, I don't disagree with the process outlined in, in in the chamber yesterday, but you may find if you look into it, there wouldn't be that too many. I know this. This the, what's reasonably significant, significant was that that decision yesterday. There's other significant ones that's been made, which is down to individual ministers. So there's a big difference in reasonably significant applications as opposed to some of the significant ones that has been passed. So I, I would agree with your approach. I mean, this I, I would expect the minister to engage, especially with the committee, in a different way in terms of some of the announcements, whatever way that that proposal may work out. But I would I would consider going down that route. 
can we agree just to write to her just to raise the issue and reflecting back on the on on the urgent question that was raised yesterday and, and the, sort of the manner in which you know, she's going to make these announcements going forward or whether there'll be any change in the process. It's only asking the question. I'm a bit hesitant. I'm not clear exactly what we're asking for. We're asking for her to change the process. We're asking her just to, you know, to, to reflect back on the <coughs> process and see whether she, she plans to make any changes given the remarks that were made in, in the chamber yesterday. Well, I, she may come back and say that she's satisfied with it. Well, I'm satisfied with the process. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, moving then on to draft minutes at uh, item 3, pages 8 and 16. These are draft minutes of the meetings of the 8th of July and the 3rd of September. Are members content? Agreed. Okay, moving then through to... Um, <coughs> Matters arising at pages 19 and 23. The matters arising from those two meetings of the 8th of July and the 3rd of September. Do members have any issues to raise from either of those meetings? We have at page 25 outstanding committee requests for information. Any comments? No? Okay. Moving then to our correspondence, item five, just draw your attention to the correspondence memo at page 30. And we've got quite a lot of um, correspondence. Um, most of the correspondence has been forwarded to members over recess. Um, we have a couple of members at page 35 and 100, members of the public from page 35 and 164 who um, have concerns in relation to um, the compulsory wearing of face masks on public transport. Um, one person has asked for um, to brief the committee in relation to this. Have members any comments? How do you deal with this, Mr. Beggs? Um, I'm picking up concern from um, members of the public using public transport because of non-compliance uh, and particularly actually amongst um, uh, post-primary school pupils. Uh, and the, the guidance has not been followed. The guidance has frequently not been followed. Um, um, so there is a real issue. I'm aware in other places, I mean, I'm aware in London, for instance, that I would say 99% of people are wearing uh, face coverings or masks, uh, but it is not taken on here. People are not appreciating the seriousness of it. I do think, I think that these pieces of correspondence might have a, a contrary view to what you're saying. Um, I, I, think perhaps, I think perhaps we should be um, seeking out uh, the most up-to-date information, because I understand new scientific information became available. For instance, the chief, science, chief medical officer originally was sceptical about it, uh, and I, personally I was uncertain, even myself, but apparently new scientific evidence emerged over the past six months which has convinced the vast majority of the scientific community that there are advantages to wearing masks in confined spaces. Jones? Yeah, sure. I know there is a number of conflicting views on this um, out in the, the ether there, but as, like what um, that Mr Beggs has said there, I've also had concerns raised with me regarding um, non-compliance. And, mo and more, uh, we understand that there are people, obviously, who are exempt from wearing masks, and that's, that's totally understandable. But one of the issues which raised with me was people were getting on public transport and as soon as they sat down, they were taking their masks off. So you had maybe 90% of them not wearing it. So it kind of defeats the purpose. And I know it's a difficult situation for, for example, TransLink staff to try and enforce it. Um, but it's just something I said I would raise because it, it is concerning. And, you know, we all have different opinions and different views. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I suppose it's, the guidance is there yeah. and it's there to be followed. So it's just to, to raise that as... Yeah. It's as really about how we deal with this, these items of correspondence, with Mr Muir. Um, obviously, there's a case made in the correspondence against face coverings, which mm -hmm. I personally wouldn't agree with. Um, and as Roy has outlined, there's a clear you know, scientific evidence that's now been presented in terms of the benefits of that. I think one of the issues of concern, I would declare, I was previously an employee of TransLink, is that um, the exemption in the regulations is for school transport services. So if you're on a scheduled service and you're over the age of 13, the regulations are quite clear that you should wear a face covering. Um, 
but if it's a dedicated school transport service, there is an exemption in the regulations. Um, I am still unsure why that exemption exists within the regulations, and it may be something that we want to follow up with the health minister who made the regulations uh, around that, because uh, what is happening is there are two different rules here, and they are confusing. And if you have a clear message for the public, I think that is something that we desperately need uh, in Northern Ireland. Anderson? Well, I mean, I think the scientific advice is there. There's international scientific advice as well as scientific advice in in the north and south across this island and and further afield. So, I think we should just, you know, capture that, and give it to him, and tell him that that's the advice that has informed the decision here, and that's what we will be complying with. Or, or do we want to forward that to the department for their um, their views? Our department. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, page fifty-five. We have the um, correspondence from the um, transport holding company just in relation to Translink. Um, obviously, Translink made an announcement yesterday in relation to um, some cash savings saving exercises. I was wondering whether members would be in agreement that perhaps we have um, Translink um, for a short session at some stage over the next few weeks, just to agree. discuss yeah. Yeah. way forward with regards to that. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, moving then, um, we also then at page 171, we have um, ministerial response to correspondence regarding issues arising from the committee on the 24th of June. Um, I suppose. An, I would like an, an update in relation to where we are with um, the legislation with regards to the MOT exemptions for mm -hmm. vehicles of historic interest. Obviously, this has been um, hanging around now for quite some time, and I know they were anticipating it coming in October, but I'm not sure whether COVID will have had an impact on that, but certainly it was something which was very much um, to the fore at the beginning of the year. So if we could get a, a confirmed timetable on, on that. Um, yeah. Um, obviously, then there's still the issues around the MOT centres, and uh, we, we have a number of issues in relation to um, MOTs themselves. And, and, I, and I suppose maybe taking it a sideways um, go at this, but I know understand that there's still an issue with regards to booking MOTs. Um, um, I think everyone's probably had a number of complaints from people trying to access the uh, appointments on by phone. And the online booking system hasn't it's been reinstated, and I understand. Yeah, well, obviously the minister will be here next week, but you know, I think people are looking for, yeah, for answers very quickly on desperate. this. And they're, you know, MOTs are, are due, um, and obviously they're not issuing TECs to four-year-old vehicles now, so people are, are finding this very difficult. So, okay. Um, any other comments in relation to to that? Do we write to the chief executive of DVA around that? And I ask think for if we can, response? yes, if we can, if we can. Yeah, because um, you know, every day I get in contact with yeah. people, and people are in a desperate state. You know. And I appreciate that you know they are on, they're using telephone lines, and, and people are under pressure. But at the same time, there was an, they should have anticipated this. Um, so it's really just to see when um, they're going to resolve that that particular issue. Um, any other comments in relation to that? No. Page 174, we've got departmental response to correspondence um, for the meeting of the 24th of June. Any comments? Okay. Um, page 221, we've correspondence from the Motorcycle Action Group, um, and they will have contacted all MLAs at various times just in relation to um, their concerns around um, the wire rope type mm. crash barriers. Um, I mean, I've I met with them, um, and I'm guessing others probably have as well. And I think they make a very valid, um, valid point and have con real genuine concerns. Um, I have put in contact with um, the officials who are undertaking the road safety strategy review, um, but I'm not sure whether members really what what your thoughts are. Um, and I would be keen that we do write to the minister in relation to the issues that they've raised. The department uh, at present are um, almost 
been driven by a European directive that they have to. This is an accepted method in Europe, and they have to. You know, it's almost like competition. They can't rule it out. That's the you know, right bit in correspondence with the department. But the correspondence we've received is indicating that uh, they are banned in Norway, mm -hmm. well, Denmark, and Netherlands. So clearly, some other countries mm -hmm. have Norway. seen fit to, to ban them. So the mm -hmm. question is. Uh, well, how have they been able to do that, but not here? Now, this is quite an important uh, issue in terms of we have some very sizable new road developments underway, the A6, the A5, and if you're going to do anything, it's best done before the, uh, the specification and the, the order is made for a new system, mm -hmm. because after that, it will be there for 20 years. We'll not have the funds to, to rip it out and, and do it over again. So um, I think we should be inquiring of the department how have other um, European countries been able to <coughs> respect the uh, road safety concerns and not use this particular system? I, I understand in, in GB now that any new roads aren't they aren't using they aren't going to be using mm -hmm. these in any future, future procurement, and where there are now faults or you know they're damaged that they aren't replacing them sort of like with like. Um, although um, I have also been told that there are they're, they already have been procured for um, some roads that you know, are currently being or in, or in line to. Um, the the correspondence I, ha I have had, the department is not has not said they're not putting this so as a specification it. going forward. So I, oh, I that's think right. that's the first point of, of uh, recognising that there's a, a difficulty and avoiding unnecessary uh, public cost uh, and dangers. Oh, so we should be pressing on specifications for future uh, uh, barrier systems in, in Northern Ireland. Okay, so members, members content with that. Okay. Content, yeah. Thank you. Um, page two four nine um, response to the eighth of July. If you have any comments, response from the minister for the economy um, in re regards to the um, the establishment of a Northern Ireland Minerals Forum. Um, any comments on that? No. Correspondence from the Committee of Finance regarding the COVID budget allocations for August. Um, we have page 428 correspondence from the Minister in relation to accelerated passage for the Harbours Bill, and she's coming tomorrow, not tomorrow, next week. Um, <laughs> gosh, I want to be here every You're very day. very keen. I am really keen, yeah, no, next Wednesday. Um, we have a request from Fermanagh from and Oma District Council to brief the committee on Brexit related issues, and obviously they've made a suggestion for next Monday, which is obviously mm. plenary day, which makes it quite difficult. Um, it's about how we, we um, respond to them. I'm not sure whether are we in a position at this stage to talk about Brexit-related issues, um, given that we haven't had up-to-date briefings from our own officials. Ms. No, sorry. Any thoughts or comments? Also conscious there's other councils and border areas that we should hear from as well. Yeah. So. So how do we ensure we do do that? You know, so. Okay. Well, we maybe just postpone that at this stage. Um, yeah, I know we discussed this at the, our strategic planning day because I know Derry and Strabane Council are also keen to have a conversation, and there will probably be a number of councils along that border mm -hmm. corridor that would want to engage with you. But I think in the first instance, uh, we would like, if it's at all possible, in the madness and chaos of Brexit, to get some clarity as to how it's going to impact. Um, on those areas, so maybe in the first instance, we would want a briefing from officials before Please. we would meet with Please the councils, and then decide whether we try and facilitate uh, a number of councils. Okay. Um, sorry, Kathy. Uh, we're getting a briefing from officials on the 23rd, so if we wait the after that and find out yeah. what they okay. say. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. The, um, also, request from um, Watertight to brief the committee on flooding-related issues. That might be something that we again maybe want to skip yeah. at a later date. Yep. yep. Okay. Correspondence from Paul Given regarding waiting areas at DVA test centres. I have put a question to the Minister in relation to this, and I subsequently I've actually received a response, uh, uh, an email from a local driving instructor where they are now looking to um, put in facilities at um, the test centres. Mr. Beggs. I, I agree with, with this issue that. Uh, the driving instructors, at the end of the day, are, are part of the clients of the testing centres, and I am shocked that they've just been left outside in the rain to do as they wish. Um, it is very—it's it's normal that 
someone immediately prior to their test would have a driving lesson and that they would do the test in the vehicle in which uh, they have learnt to drive in. So th the practical outcome of that is the, uh, uh, um, um, the, the instructor would finalise by driving to the test centre, allowing the student to, to do the test in the car and they would stay there. So to me, some provision should be made for the customers, because this is part of the customers of the test centres, and, and uh, I think we should be urging that suitable shelter be made available. Yeah, no, I, I understand that they have, that they are going to do that now, but... Um, it's, in every test centre? I understand so, but at the, sa at the same time, I think that this should have all been um, anticipated, yeah, yeah. and that it shouldn't then have to have been raised as an issue. Yeah. Yeah. But we can we could maybe write just to get some um, up to date information as to how that is actually progressing, okay. and what type of facility is going to be provided. Any other issues in relation to correspondence? No. Okay. Um, thank you. We move then to um, item six, which is the SL one for the Planning Act 2011 um, review you? regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and it's at page 480. 480. 480. Um, and this is um, subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. Um, again, it, if members are content, there there isn't a great deal of information in relation to this, and and I would be proposing that we perhaps have officials to. Um, next week's meeting if they're available or at the earliest meeting that they can make themselves available just to get some more information because really this is the stage in which we can, can influence this. Um, members, any comments? Yeah. Mr Muir? Yeah, I entirely agree, Chairperson. Um, this is an important issue um, and planning is going to be really key now but it's also key for the recovery of uh, our economy so we need to get this review right and this is an opportunity for the committee to influence that so <coughs> we have an opportunity to engage with officials around that um, to find out a bit more as you said there's very little detail here but also to offer some feedback on that I think would be important so I really welcome that proposal. Okay, Chair, could I also suggest uh, maybe a research paper in relation to the original act yeah. and what it's supposed to do the just to give us yeah. give us wee overhead because we'll, we'll be looking at the I know the terms of reference would be asking those questions, but maybe a research paper might help us and um, you know, give us some scope for questions when they do come up as well. Oh, that would be okay. helpful. Yeah. Ms. Uh, yes, um, Chair, I would um, concur with that. Given that the initial review was due in April 2018, mm -hmm. um, then you know, we're a year and a half um, forward, so we would need to refresh ourselves mm -hmm. as to what was supposed to have happened at that time. And we all know we're dealing with um, a volume of applicants who are really concerned about the planning process in itself anyway. Mm -hmm. So, as you say, we need to get in now and try to influence the development and the shape of this review before it just lands on our desk as a fait accompli. I know, I mean, the, 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 the terms with the off, of reference are fairly broad, but at the same yeah. time, I think it's still, it would still be useful to have that conversation with, yeah. with officials. Okay. All right, thank you. Moving then to um, item 7, SL1, amendments to the carriage of dangerous goods and use of transportable pressure, equipment regulation, Northern Ireland 2010, and it's at page 485. The rule is subject to a negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. Um, the purpose of the statutory rule is to reinstate the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs as the competent authority. Um, for Northern Ireland for the functions of um, it's under the European agreement concerning the international carriage of dangerous goods by road treaty in relation to the carriage of class 7 goods and that's radioactive by road so the proposed statutory rule seeks to correct an error and reinstate there as the competent authority in relation to carriage of radioactive goods by road are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule uh, Chair, can I, can I ask you just, has, has Dara agreed that, um, that they will become the competent authority in relation to the, the carriage of the radioactive goods uh, by road? Um, yes. Um, Minister Malin has written to Ministers for Economy and Dara to advise them of her intention to bring forward this amending regulation. Um, and I'm guessing that there has been no objection, hence why we have it here. Yeah. 
Maybe that was it. It seems to have been. It seems to have been an error. So um, okay. I think that Dare already have um, similar functions. So this is where this should sit. And there's no real-term effects with the with uh, transferring this authority over. This is technical rather than no. It, the, the mistake is that place. the mistake is that it's actually an infrastructure rather yeah. than Dara. Yeah, the same should have been in the first okay. place. Okay. So you content? Yep. yep. Okay, um, item 8 is SL1, the Motor Vehicles Driving Licenses Amendment, Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and it's at page 489. Uh, members will note that this uh, proposal was considered via correspondence on the 14th of August, in which members gave their approval for the proposal and ratified under matters arising. This is for the purpose of having a formal record of the agreement. The members listed below give their consent via email to the proposal for the SL1, Michelle McElveen, David Hildage, Andrew Muir, Keith Buchanan, Martina Anderson, Carol Boylan and Liz Kimmins. Are members content to ratify the SL1? Yep. Uh, right. Go ahead. Oh, um, just a point I would like, like to make on it. Uh, in part of the correspondence, we're told that there would be uh, carrying out of spot checks at the roadside as part of the compliance and safety check. And these are public vehicles and it is important that they are up to standard. One taxi driver who was in touch with myself who was saying that they're not using um, intelligence uh, uh, decision making as to who they do their, their spot checks and send to MOT centres. He referred to a time when he had a, a his taxi had been um, um, assessed six weeks earlier, it was a two-year-old vehicle, a new car, recently inspected, and he was pulled in at the roadside, nothing was detected, and he was instructed to go to a test centre, and when they got there, they were shocked that he had been sent there and couldn't find anything wrong. So I think we need to reinforce that in order to protect public safety, it ne needs to be sensible spot checks, not disrupting business unnecessarily, and to target those who uh, may be suspected as not keeping their vehicles uh, up to standards. Well, are members content to obviously we'll ratify this, but write to the department just highlighting that as, a, as an issue? Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, item 9, SL1, Llewellyn Drive, Lisburn Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. Um, this rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of road comprising the footway commencing at 0.45 metres northwest of the junction of Llewellyn Drive and Llewellyn Avenue. The abandonment has been requested by a local property developer to facilitate construction of a new development. The bed and soil of the area to be abandoned is owned by a third party and following the abandonment it will revert back to them. Um, there were two um, and are two objections to this proposal and obviously we have just welcome um, Deidre Gallagher and, and, and Victor Clegg to um, the, the meeting this morning. Um, perhaps you could maybe explain um, the issues around this and what the objections were. Sorry, this is uh, Llewellyn Drive. Llewellyn Drive, please, yes. Uh. <coughs> Basically, the, the objection came in from one of the councillors. He had been approached by two uh, residents living in Llewellyn Drive who had complained about the need for the abandonment. Basically, it was taking away a small area of footway. Uh, now, the abandonment was required because a developer had bought land and was basically building two new houses. And one of the planning conditions for this development was that he seek the abandonment of this stretch of footway where they were making driveways for the new properties. Um, as I say, the councillor wrote in to express the concerns that had been raised by his constituents and that under the rules has to be treated as an objection. And that was and really the objection was that it shouldn't be abandoned as opposed to any other Basically yes. Uh -huh. but they it didn't see any need for it to be abandoned. Uh, you've indicated there's going to be uh, new driveways, but will the footpath be replaced where there's not a driveway? Uh, the footpath hasn't gone. Essentially, this was an area behind the footpath. Uh, okay. The original layout of it, rather than uh, rather than creating a driveway into the house in the corner number two, 
that widened the area of the path, that squared off the foot of the path, basically the developer, uh, whenever the abandonment goes through, the footway remains as is. It's still a two metre wide footway in front of the properties. It just doesn't extend back into that corner. Okay. Any other? It's had a satisfied plan and condition, yeah. And to satisfy plan and condition, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, are members content with the proposals for the statutory room? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Please. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Okay. SL one, um, item ten, SL one, support for the taxi industry, and that's at page four nine seven. Members will note that this proposal was considered via correspondence on the first of September, twenty twenty, in which members gave their approval for the proposal and ratified under matters rising. This is for the purpose of having a formal record of the agreement. Um, and the members listed below gave their consent via email to the proposal for the SL1. Now, my name isn't on this, although I did check back and I did send the email in. All right. um, so, so Michelle McElveen, David Hildage, Andrew Muir, Keith Buchanan, Martina Anderson, Cahill Boylan and Liz Kimmins. Members uh, intend to ratify. Thank you. Yeah. SL item 11, SL1, um, the Kilshinny Park Macrofelt Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, at page 501. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of 35 square metres of road comprising part of a former turning point at number 10, Kilshinny Park Macrofelt. The area of road to be abandoned. Um, commences at a point directly adjacent to the southeast corner of the boundary of number 10 and extends for a distance of 17 metres in a northeasterly direction. The abandonment has been requested by the owner of number 10, Kushini Park, Macrofelt. The area or road in question has already been integrated into the garden of his property and a boundary wall erected. The proposed abandonment will regularise the situation on the ground. Mr Buchanan. Yeah, uh, just on that, I've no issue, obviously, or no objections to it, but just on the consultation, the PSA have been consulted, and the refers also to Derry City and Sirvan. I don't know whether that's a typo mm. or an error, but it's, it's their own district area, it's with Ulster Council. Okay. I've no issue with it, but it's just I want, I want to highlight the fact that it's, whether it's been consulted to the correct council or whether it's just an error. We'll write and find out. We'll write and find out. We need to, definitely need to find it out. <laughs> well, it would be bad if I didn't write it up, wouldn't it? That would be pretty poor form, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be out with, wouldn't it? There. Okay, so we'll, um, subject to that yeah, being no clarified, issue. we're fine yeah. with that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so the members are content um, with the proposals. Um, item 12, subordinate legislation, SRs. Um, and do, we, do we want to do this now, or do we want to take... Uh, are they here? Are they here? We could, well, do you want, at this moment in time, do you want to, to take the briefing? We're, all, we're fine for time. Rest, rest, rest. Okay, we'll get through it's the rest of it. Okay. So, subordinate legislation SR is not subject to assembly proceedings at page 506, SR 2020 137, the Road Race Scarron Point Hill Climb, Order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 1st of July and was content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Great. The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020 137, the Road Races Garen Point Hill Climb Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Page 512 is SR 2020-156, the waiting, parking and waiting restrictions, Ballyclare Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Okay. <clears throat> That the <coughs> Committee for Infrastructure is considered SR 2020 156, the parking and waiting restrictions, Ballyclare Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and now has no objection to the rule. Page 516, SR 2020 157, the parking and waiting restrictions, Kilkeel Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was contend. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered at the Committee. Are members content with the rule? 
Great. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-157, the parking and waiting restrictions, Kilkeel Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Page 525 with SR 2020-158, the Taxis Macrofelt Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 29th of April 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the Committee. Are members content with this rule? It's very the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-158, the Taxis Macrofelt Order Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. At page 528, SR 2020-159, the Parking Places on Roads and Waiting Restrictions Macrofelt Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Yep. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-159, the parking places on roads and waiting restrictions, Macrofeld Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. At page 532, SR 2020-171, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions, Newton Ards Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the Committee. Are members content with the rule? That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-171, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions, Newton Ards Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. At page 537, SR 2020-172, the Parking Places, Loading Bay and Waiting Restrictions, Port Stewart Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was contend. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the Committee. Are members content with this rule? Right. The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-172, the parking places, loading bay and waiting restrictions, Port Stewart Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020 and has no objection to the rule. At page 541, SR 2020-173, the Roads Speed Limit Order, Northern Ireland 2020, the proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the Committee. Are members content with this rule? The Committee for, the Infra for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-173, the Road Speed Limit Order Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. At page 547, we have SR 2020-174, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions, Newton Abbey Order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the Committee. Are members content with the rule? Okay. The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-174, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions, Newton Abbey Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Page 560, we have SR 2020-175, the Parking Places on, Northern, on Roads and Waiting Restrictions, Newry Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with the rule? Okay. That the committee for infrastructure was considered has considered SR 2020-175, the parking places and roads and waiting restrictions, Newry Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. At page 563, SR 2020-176, the road races Cookstown 100, Order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 1st of July and was content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-176, the route races Cookstown 100 order Northern Ireland 2020 and there's no objection to the rule. SR 2020-177, the uh, Romer Road Belfast Footway Abandonment Order um, Northern Ireland 2020 at page 571, the 
The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SR1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with the rule? The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-177, the Ormer Road, Belfast, Footway Abandonment Order in Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, there is no objection to the rule. Item 14, SR 2020-180, the A29, New Road, and B30, Newbury Road, Silver Bridge Abandonment Order in Northern Ireland 2020. You find this at page 579. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was content that the rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change in the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with the rule? The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-180, the A29 New Road and B30. Newry Road, Silverbridge, Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules has no objection to the rule. Okay. Item 15, SR 2020, 181, page, at page 587, the Witness Street, Belfast Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 8th of July <coughs> and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? That the Committee for Infrastructure is considered SR 2020-181, the Whitless Street Belfast Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules is no objection to the rule. Item 16, page 596. It was SR 2020-182, the Railway Avenue Newry Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Right. The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-182, the Railway Avenue Newry Abandonment Order in Northern Ireland 2020 and subject to the examiner statutory rules has no objection to the rule. SR 2020-183, the Back Street Duncairn Gardens, Belfast Abandonment Order in Northern Ireland 2020. You find that at page 604. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 8th of July 2020 and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Okay. The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-183, the Back Street at Duncairn Gardens Belfast Abandonment Order in Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Item 18, page 612. The SR 2020-184, the footpath to the rear of Albert Street Quadrant Place and Culling Tree Road, Belfast Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 8th of July and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? That the Committee for Infrastructure is considered SR 2020-184, the footpath to the rear of Albert Street Quadrant Place and Culling Tree Road, Belfast Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules has no objection to the rule. SR 2020-188, the Motor Vehicles Driving Licences Amendment, Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, you find this at page 620. The proposal uh, for the rule was considered by the committee on the 14th of August 2020 via correspondence and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Good. That the Committee for Infrastructure has, has considered SR 2020-188, the Motor Vehicles Driving Licences Amendment course coronavirus regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules has no objection to the rule. Item 20, SR 2020, 190, the 
Taxi Licensing Amendment Number Two, Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and you'll find that at page 6:30. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 1st of September 2020 via correspondence and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There's been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? But the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020 the um, Taxi Licensing Amendment No. 2, Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Right. That's the end of that session. Well done. <laughs> That's well done, Chair. I, okay, so I just see Alex, I see Alex Ferguson has moved the Transport Legislation Unit there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, we can now breathe again. So. We're then moving then on to our, our briefing. Um, we have the room until midday, so we have just over an, an, just slightly over an hour for the briefing from Northern Ireland Quarter, and Hansart will record this session. Um, and we will welcome um, Sarah Venning, um, the Chief Executive of Northern Ireland Water and um, Ronan Larkin, who's the Director of Finance and Regulation for Northern Ireland Water. Good morning. Good morning. morning. <coughs> Last time we saw you was before a pandemic. We were able to sit in a normal room. We were, that's yes, right. Remember that? <laughs> so you're both very welcome um, to to the meeting this morning. Um, we have just around an hour um, for your presentation and for your questions. And um, certainly if we do run out of time, there'll be plenty of opportunity to to, to speak again. I um, appreciate um, the time that you took a number of weeks ago where you, you met with myself and, and the deputy chair um, to, go th to go through your report uh, and that was very welcome at, at that stage. So if you would um, like to um, start your presentation and we'll follow up with some questions. Perfect. So I'm assuming you can see the presentation on your yeah, yeah. iPad, sir. Thank you. Uh, so thanks very much for your time this morning. Uh, Ronan and I are delighted to join you to give you an update on Northern Ireland Waters 1920 Annual Report and Accounts. So you have a short presentation within your packs, which I hope we can use as the basis of our discussion this morning. Um, it has been a very busy few months since, since we all last met, and I suppose I really would like to start off this session by paying tribute to all the team in NI Water who have worked tirelessly and have been working uh, continuously to make sure that the seamless provision of water and wastewater services continued from the outset of COVID and the lockdown through to now. Um, and we were faced with a number of very significant challenges, probably brought about by both weather and um, weather conditions and changes in customer demand. So a hugely busy time and tribute to the team who um, picked up that slack. Um, if, I, if I take you on to the second slide, which is called about our report, I also hope that we did share a link, an electronic link to our annual report and accounts, and I hope you've maybe had a chance to have a flick through them. Um, I very much commend the document to you. We launched that document at the end of August, and um, as the Chair has said, we couldn't uh, brief the full committee at that time, but we did get the opportunity to speak to the Chair and Deputy Chair, and we were very grateful for your time. The uh, annual integrated report and accounts, so the, the point of them really is to meet the information needs of all our stakeholders and to tell the story of how we are delivering what matters uh, by creating and, uh, creating and sustaining value over short, medium and long term. And that value is not just financial value, so you will see it extends across all six capitals, so that's financial capital, natural capital, social capital, human, manufactured and intellectual capital. And the reason that we talk in those terms is to ensure that uh, we are profiting from creating sustainable solutions for the people and for the planet. Uh, we have included material and information that we believe uh, is of interest to our stakeholders and presented in such a way that is fair, balanced and understandable. We have been working on this sort of annual report and accounts and this uh, approach to reporting over a number of years, but this is our first integrated report. And integrated reporting is really about 
trying to tell a simple and concise story of how organisations create and sustain value. Um, on to the third slide, which is a lovely uh, photograph of our chairman. Um, uh, this year we launched our new strategy to address those challenges of uh, creating and sustaining value over the long, medium and short term. Um, and that strategy looks uh, to the uh, it supports long term thinking by looking to the next quarter of a century um, and put, to try to put us in the best position to support a, clean, a cleaner, greener uh, and more prosperous society in Northern Ireland. Uh, we were very much encouraged by the broad endorsement that we got from our stakeholders for that strategy and the profile that was given to water and wastewater infrastructure in the New Decade New Approach document agreement, um, uh, also by the re-established Assembly and the high profile that has been given to our challenges by our Minister for Infrastructure, so those are all very welcome. Um, if I take you on to the next slide, which uh, is entitled Rains and Cranes, I guess quite stark this um, and uh, lack of investment is sinking Northern Ireland water. That's the phrase that we used when we launched the annual report and accounts. And I guess Water companies sit at the heart of society and they provide an essential service and there is a considerable health dimension to what we do, um, whether it's abstracting clean water or wastewater treatment. They have, both of those activities have major environmental consequences um, and the infrastructure that we have as a foundation for sustainable economic growth. But despite all those very worthy things, here in Northern Ireland, we are unique. We are the only region within the UK uh, with a funding model for those essential services where us, the regulated water utility, are unable to fully implement the economic regulator's final determination of what is needed for the citizens here as a direct result of public expenditure constraints. Now, as an organisation, we have continued to successfully deliver private sector levels of performance and efficiency, and we know that because we are compared with private sector water companies. Um, but this is absolutely at risk in the light of sustained and the sustained and significant underfunding. Um, by way of uh, demonstration, the PC15 business plan that ran six years from 2015 to 2021 started with a constrained capital funding um, amount of 990 million when Northern Ireland needed 1.7 billion spent. Uh, that has been further constrained by public expenditure cuts over the period um, and the underfunding has now already resulted in curbs to economic growth with new developments and businesses being unable to connect to sewage systems in major parts of our cities in over 100 towns. And that's shown on the diagram with the red circles. And you can see that it's all over Northern Ireland. It's not in one particular geography. The underfunding in this PC15 period is part of a generational underinvestment that has happened in sewage infrastructure. And that adds complexity and it adds significant inefficiency to the delivery of longer term asset resilience. It risks deterioration in the levels of service for customers and it is leading to inadequate environmental protection because there will be increases in out of sewer flooding and in pollution. And if I take you on to uh, the next slide, slide five, unless we start investing properly in our failing wastewater infrastructure, we will have to make difficult choices about our economy and our natural environment and that's us, the citizens of Northern Ireland. The scale of the problem requires a major inescapable step change in investment, and that's what we've put forward in our business plan for the next price control, PC21, where we've set out over £2 billion of investment uh, required, which includes half a billion pounds of investment for the Living with Water programme to address strategic drainage challenges in Belfast. And what the slide's showing here, I hope it's a slide with a little thermometer on it, um, is how the £2 billion worth of investment would be allocated. And I guess the first thing that you have to do with any system is maintain what you've got. So we have to maintain the equipment we have, keep it running. We then need to future-proof and to modernise. That's the next tranche of investment. 
and we then invest in our clean in making sure that our drinking water is clean and safe. And that leaves us with the remainder of the uh, investment, a good 50% of the two billion, to address the drainage infrastructure deficits. Now, it is a huge amount of investment at two billion pounds, but. Uh, what we're trying to demonstrate in this slide is that if, if the programme was cut by £50 million, pounds, which is a small amount when you compare it to £2 billion, it has a significant impact and will be felt, uh, really felt, right across Northern Ireland. So the, cap, the, the PC21 programme has about 49 chunky, big, significant wastewater projects. If you cut 50 million, just 50 million out of this two billion pound program, if, not a few, if it, if it gets cut, 21 wastewater projects wouldn't be carried out and would be deferred to the next price control in PC27. But that's 21 places where um, development will continue to be constrained for a further six <coughs> years, um, and that increases if 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 a hundred million, if a cut of a hundred million was made, that would be 35 projects not happening. And if capital spend was kept at the levels that we have now, if someone said, "Well, it's not too bad today, just keep it as it is," almost no wastewater projects would be able to be progressed, um, and and. I can tell from the correspondence that I get from across the room and from your uh, party colleagues that would have a big impact. Um, taking you on then to the, the next slide, uh, using less drinking water. Earlier this summer, so after we left and everybody uh, went into lockdown, the weather was fantastic and people were at home and the usage pattern of water changed um, quite significantly and we experienced a huge demand surge for water um, followed by concerns because there had been no rain that actually we were in the, drip, in the grip of a drought. So uh, citizens, all of us, we use uh, around 70% more water in our homes than we did 40 years ago and as a society more needs to be done to reduce that water footprint by making our homes and business more water efficient, by better understanding the hidden water and the products that we buy, by designing our homes to use uh, green water such as recycled water, storm water or maybe rain water to flush toilets, to wash clothes and for outdoor use. The average person could reduce their water usage by 40 per cent. Um, and Northern Ireland's total water demand could be brought down by 25%, um, and that can help to drive further dive down leakage. It can drive down your, our carbon footprint. It can increase resilience so that actually you have more capacity for water in times when the demand increases, and also ease the pressure on the sewerage infrastructure because if you're not using the water, you're not pushing it into the sewers. So that's a big challenge for society as a whole, reducing the amount of water that, that we consume. You haven't got the hot tubs on there? Uh, yes, well, don't please start me about hot tubs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I'd like to hear about it. <laughs> um, Seemed everybody got one during the summer. No. So, the, 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 moving on, then the, uh, the next slide, which has a wonderful picture of me. Uh, our purpose as an organisation is to provide the water for life we all rely on to thrive. We do deliver great tasting, safe drinking water to our customers, and we recycle their wastewater safely back to the natural environment. We are really proud of the significant achievements that we've made in both water and wastewater services. We have been leading the challenge in doing more for less. We've been delivering record levels of service for our customers while reducing our cost base through sustainable efficiencies. And much of the work that we're doing, well, this is the last year of PC15, will build the foundation for further transformational changes in our next price control period, which runs out to 2027. We expect to hear from the utility regulator by the end of this month as they determine on our draft business plan. So we'll get their feedback by the end of this month and they'll make their final determination by March. Uh, the next slide sets out uh, and, and start, has the caption, not all heroes wear capes. Mm -hmm. So the COVID outbreak in, in late 19, in 1920 was one of our biggest challenges to date. Um, however, we activated our business continuity plans, our pandemic major incident plan. We had 800, almost 800 home workers within a day working from home, um, and our frontline staff continued to work 
uh, suitably uh, equipped with PPE to maintain the essential supply of water and wastewater services. So we're really proud of how the team picked up um, in that <coughs> regard and made sure that actually I, I calculate that the hand washing that we all need probably accounts for an extra 12 litres of water per day. Um, and that's there seamlessly in this country for everyone. I, I was talking to colleagues across the water industry yesterday where that's not always the case. And in some countries, water is regarded as a form of PPE against COVID. So it's, it's unusual. And we wouldn't think of that in, in, in a country like ours. Um, on the next slide, business strategy. Just to, be, as we launched our new strategy and in this annual report and accounts, we've moved to reporting against uh, our new five strategic priorities and the strategic priorities focus on sustainably growing all those forms of capital that, that I um, called out earlier to ensure that we put back more than we take out. So that's what we're keen to do. And, and then there are five priorities, so we'll just quickly uh, update you on each of those five. I'll take the first two and then hand over to Ronan. So the first being um, customer and for each of the five strategic priorities we set out how we will measure progress against the various areas of focus and, and, and hopefully you've been able to see that in the slides yourself. In the case of our customer objective, we want customers to be able to engage with us how they want to, so through the channel of, uh, of their choice. So there's a big digital element in, in that work and in 1920 we have been driving a very large cyber security programme within Northern Ireland water and that's something that will continue for the next few years. We use something called the Net Promoter Score to allow us to compare ourselves with other service providers. So we don't just compare ourselves with um, water companies, we can prefer, compare ourselves with any service provider using the Net Promoter Score. And we will also ensure that we look after and pay special attention to our vulnerable customers and, and that measure keeps us honest there. In relation then to water, clean, safe water provision is at the heart of what we do. And here we look at how we ensure we get the best raw water and that we have enough water. And that's not something that you can take for granted, that water is wholesome <coughs> and that it's not being wasted and that it is always on. So there's been lots of successes in this area over the 1920 year, from our work uh, on restoring blanket bogs in our catchments to ensuring that we have storage capacity in our distribution network, to driving down supply interruptions for customers. One area that has been a, a, an ongoing challenge is that of leakage. And leakage is a challenge for the entire industry um, and one uh, that you know, it can be prone to media attention. When money is tight, which it is for us, and actually it's only in August this year that we had our operating budget um, approved, it's easy to sacrifice leakage detection is not strictly necessary. So someone might say, well, if you just have to do the, what's necessary, maybe leakage isn't necessary. But we believe it is absolutely necessary because if you don't keep on top of your leakage, you lose the extra headroom in your system for when people need lots of, uh, need extra water, need resilience in times of extreme weather events, whether that be heat or whether that be cold. Um, so it's a very important um, measure to continue to confund and, in, and, and invest in. So, Ronald, I'll, I'll hand over to you on economy. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, committee. Um, so on, on economy there, um, what we set out as our, our strategic approach, our theme there, is efficiently delivering infrastructure <coughs> to underpin sustainable growth in Northern Ireland. <coughs> and you can see the, the, the three areas of focus there. Funding world-class economic infrastructure. We think Northern Ireland should be should be world-class in this area. It should, it should have the, the best, the same, enjoy the best as, as uh, you know other areas of the UK and other economies across the world. We know we have an obligation to make our services efficient and affordable for everyone. So whether it's for the domestic, which is currently paid for by subsidy, or whether it's for business users who pay directly for the services we provide, they should be efficient and affordable and able to fit in with with a, with a business's budget. And in terms of sustainable growth, um, the strategy sets out we firmly believe, and others have examined this as well, Ulster University and others have examined, um, we're a key driver of sustainable growth in what should be a modern, strong regional economy here in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is going to have to punch above its weight to keep its economy uh, alive and well, and no doubt uh, modern 21st century infrastructure has a key role to play in that, so we, we have to own our part with that. 
So you can see the, 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 the piece then under the, on the, under the strategic performance indicators there. We've just set out where those indicators are. So an increase or a decrease in customer tariffs, uh, excluding inflation. And you can see across the piece there, we're not finished 19, sorry, we're not finished uh, 2021 at this point, but in the 1920 year, uh, we, 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 we hit the target there. We came in under the target and uh, we passed that. 2021, we're, we're working on that at the moment. We did defer an increase in tariff in the first half of the year, and so we hope that we can come in under the, the inflation levels and so on in the second half of the year as well in terms of the, the full year. Um, a new measure that we look at is, the, as Sir referred to previously, a reduction in the number of areas with development constraints. This is something that all of you are familiar with around the committee table today, and you can see the measles maps from before. Pretty much across Northern Ireland, there are areas that will be constrained for economic growth now. So one of our targets that we're putting into our strategy going forward is an indicator that tells us how we're doing against taking those down. <coughs> And improving that picture, but of course that depends on investment and having the money available to put into the drains and the ground, particularly in this case. And then the other one that's important, I think we, I think we pride ourselves in Northern Ireland on our our, our environmental conditions. Often we, we we're seen as a sort of green a green and pleasant land. Um, and before COVID, we were working really hard, I think, here in this part of the world to attract uh, tourism to, to the to the region, and we had some successful, you know, successful events across the years. With that, the last one being the, the, the major golf tournament up in the northwest. So, we want to make sure that we can continue to do that and be part of that. So, if, if we're doing our job properly, if we're doing our environmental role properly, then our bathing water quality um, should be able to hit those excellent or good areas. And you can see where we've set out there in the targets over the years. The majority are excellent or good. There are none poor. We want to keep that score up. Again, that depends on investment. We're not the only part of that story. We have to look wider at you know, where do these other pollution sources come from. We want to be part of that conversation as well. But when we have to own our part on the work we do, you can see that we're passing the, the, the target there, and we want to make sure that we can continue to do that and, and, and grow our, our performance there. And then on the right-hand side of that slide, planning for the future, we, we, we've just set out that, that little graphic shows just a number of things that we have uh, in, in the business plan going forward in PC21 where we will look to, to improve how we provide the service. So how do we, you know, the contact management centre, what's the best way for us to work with customers when they need us and when they ring in for the problem or an issue? Um, our asset delivery, uh, the decisions and capabilities around how we, how we go about delivering our asset uh, delivery programme. Um, energy and the, the climate uh, change and net zero carbon, you can see on there as well. We, we think we have a role to play in that, a huge role to play in that. We're the largest single user of, of electricity in Northern Ireland. And I don't say that as a proud boast. That's something we want to work on and improve, and therefore we can be part of the new kind of, you know, infrastructure uh, uh, network for for improved energy in, in in Northern Ireland going forward. Smart metering, so where we have to meter for businesses, we should have better <coughs> metering and better technology deployed, so we can help businesses drive down their usage of water and make sure that they're using water efficiently as well. Those are just a number of things that we have in in the piece. And I suppose the last thing to say about the economy, when we're investing. We're, we're employing uh, local contractors here often and, and local people uh, with businesses here. So when, when we're investing, there's a real trickle-down impact, a positive impact for the local economy here. For every pound we put in, Ulster University did a, a piece of work a few years ago that says there's sort of two and a half times uh, rotation around the economy of that money. So that has to, investment is good news for, for the infrastructure, but it's also good news for our wider economy here in Northern Ireland. If we then move on to nature again, this is one of our our key themes going forward now, so protecting and enhancing the natural environment, and you can see there are the, the, the areas of focus, a more resilient network, so uh, it can deal with, with different events, it can deal with weather events, we saw some flooding recently and we want to make sure that our network continues to hold up during events like that. Sustainable solutions, and we have, a, we have an example of one of those on the right, right hand side there, the diagrams there, the, the wetland uh, treatment centre at, at Clavey in County Fermanagh, so this is, this is a more sustainable way of treating some wastewater than the traditional sort of build, a, build a wastewater treatment works, which is powered by carbon. This is a different approach, which we can deploy in some areas, not all areas, but we've had some success in this in recent years, and this is another example of that. Um, keep it clear, so making sure that you know, we're, 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 the networks are running, we're keeping those right, and, and, and everything is working well. And then towards zero carbon, which is a, a big piece for us to think about in, in Northern Ireland, the, the, the climate uh, challenge is, is ever closer, net zero carbon comes ever closer, and again we're looking at a number of plans. I saw an announcement yesterday from the Department for Economy, I think, where they, they, had, they had announced some, some exciting news, I think, around hydrogen programmes. We believe we have a role to play with that, and we're actively working with a number of departments at the minute where we think we can bring a, possibly a pilot uh, solution in place there where we, we would be part and parcel of that piece. 
So you can see there again the targets that we've set out there. The one I'll, I'll highlight is the where we didn't pass, we failed uh, in the 1920 year in the reduction in the number of properties at risk of out of zero flooding, and that's a key target for us. But it's also a key target for customers. No one ever wants to be flooded, and the, the, we had an issue there around a scheme at, at, in, in Belfast at Ravenhill Avenue, where we had a number of complexities that came to light as we started to explore the, getting ready to do that scheme. It became apparent that that was going to be a much bigger scheme than we had originally, and other stakeholders had originally envisaged. So we weren't able to go ahead with that scheme. That, that scheme is now being replanned to take forward and deliver. In terms of people, then, so Sarah has talked about uh, our people, um, and we, you know, through COVID, and we really saw that we saw our whole workforce, and not least our, our front line, really come to the fore. Right across the business, everything continued to work, and our, our people are, you know, that they make that work, and we're grateful for them for their input. So. We want to make sure Northern Ireland Water is a great place to work for everyone who wants to come and work there and everyone who is working there currently. So we want to be powered by talent, the right people with the right skills and talents, trained and developed to do the job. Um, we talk about happy, safe and healthy people. People should be happy at their work and they should be safe. They should feel that when they go out in the morning they're going to be safe during their job and they can, they can return home to their families in the evening. And then creating a legacy for our community. So our, our, our workforce takes a huge pride in what they do and we know that when we connect our workforce to even charitable, you know, corporate social responsibility and maybe some sort of voluntary work in the community, it, they really get a, a fantastic lift from that and they, they feel really part and parcel of that community. So we want to make sure that we can continue to do that piece. Um, we, we, we set ourselves um, some, some fairly high targets there around engagement, employee engagement, and you can see that's, that's one that we failed. So we have action plans in place to address those areas and to continue to improve how we engage with our staff right across the piece. And we've kept those plans running through COVID. We've kept surveying and talking with our staff and putting initiatives in place and making sure that even, even remotely staff can access the, the well-being and, and the welfare and the support facilities they need. And we've had good feedback from staff on that as well during the, this period of COVID. Some of the stats there, we want to make sure that all of what we do there is supported by by diversity and inclusion right across the range of issues for diversity today. And just here, the number of stats there, you can see some of the work that we're doing around making sure that we're not missing out on attracting the female part of our population into our, into our workplace around some of the, the schemes we're doing. So you can see there, we have 21% of, of females employed. Um, the, the, um, the, you know, the, we want to make sure that at senior management representation and right across the, the, the board, we, we, have the, we, we have stronger intake and stronger, um, you know, we, we're attractive to, to, to women coming in to work in the workplace and, and own their part in what we do. There are some challenges in there. We're, we're an engineering-led organisation and a frontline-led organisation, and traditionally that's been something that has been main, is predominantly male-orientated, but we're doing huge work at the moment to make sure that those jobs that we're putting out in the market um, are attractive to, to everyone who can apply for those and, and as long as they have the right skills. In terms of then the finances, so there's a graphic there, then you, you'll see there's a little schematic that explains our finances. So we talk about our revenue, where does our money come from, our, our operating costs, where we get the loan money, where do we get the money to, to, to pay the contractors who build the capital schemes, and then how that tumbles down in terms of uh, results. So um, the, the, the bulk of our revenue comes from government subsidy at the minute. So in 1920, we received a subsidy of just under £310 million. And, and that's money that's, that's coming in to us because we're not, at this point, we're not billing uh, any of us at home. We don't, we don't get a water bill at home. So that's the money required to, to pay for that domestic subsidy. Um, but then we also bill non-domestic customers, and that generated, uh, you can see the figure there, uh, 80, just over £80 million of revenue from businesses, and then the further road uh, drainage charges of uh, £22.6 million, which is uh, paid by the Department for Infrastructure. In terms of keeping the, the, you know, taking their drainage issues away and, and dealing with, with what comes off the roads, and then there's a series of other other forms of income, just over 16 million pound. So that's infrastructure charges, connection charges, that kind of work, and, and some ancillary pieces around the edge of that as well. Um, our day-to-day -day operating costs. Um, so our running cost total uh, 282 million pounds in 1920, and that's the range of things we've talked about: staff costs, power costs, our rates bill. We pay about 30 million pound in rates and then hired and contracted services in from the marketplace as well. Um, you can see how that, that, that tumbles down then into operating profit. So it looks quite healthy, an operating profit um, of £147 million. So the committee could think, well, we can stop right there. That's, that's fantastic. Why would you ever need more money? Um, but again, if, if you look at that, we're financing our investment. We're paying money back. So the loans that we borrow from government, we pay back interest on those. We also, um, you know, each year we also pay dividend, and we have to service the PPP loans that are in place as well for the, the, the two big PPP schemes, um, Alpha and Omega, that are there in place as well. Um, 
So that reduces that profit, that, that profit from 147 to just under 85 million. We then we don't pay corporation tax currently so, because we have capital allowances, so we're able to use those capital allowances. But we put a deferred charge away in the year, so you see the profit after tax then at, at 48.4 million. And then out of that, we're, we'll, we'll be examining an upcoming board meeting the payment for the dividend of 1920, and that would be just under 30 million. So even in the year, there's about 80 odd million pound that goes back in through government, whether it's in the form of interest on the loans or the dividend. And any surplus, as you can see on the right-hand side, any surplus profit, that doesn't leave Northern Ireland, it doesn't, doesn't get paid to, out in dividends and so on beyond the, the dividend we pay to the department, it gets reinvested back in, so it helps us reduce the loans on the piece as well. And you can see there the government loans in, in 1920 we borrowed 40 million from government and uh, we, we, we invested then just over 180 million pounds. In, in the asset base. So that, that's a simple way of looking at how the finances work. But none of the profit that we make extra profit of, our profits are strong, it doesn't give us extra spending power, it doesn't give the department extra spending power, and it doesn't give us extra money to invest in capital because they're restricted by the constraints that Sarah referred to in the capital and resource deal lines that, that come down from the, the block grant, as it were. The, the media has looked at the annual report and accounts this year, and some of you may well have seen the coverage on that, and there was strong interest from the media. So, a number of things that came out of that was the, the, the question around the broken funding model. Is this the best way to fund Northern, Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland's need for, for drainage infrastructure and for water infrastructure? And we think the model has some merits, but we know that the constraints on what we can, what we can access for capital uh, currently cause big issues around our economy, and they can also lead to environmental damage. Sarah's talked about leakage, so we won't go back over that. Um, wastewater compliance. Um, I, I guess you know, there is an incomplete picture there right across the whole wastewater system. We know that that's an area that we have to up our game, and to up our game we have to invest in both running costs and capital costs, because again, we want Northern Ireland to be world class in, in this particular area. And then um, people talk about, well, you're, you're a highly profitable company, surely you can stand on your own two feet. We get our money from government predominantly, and we get our capital allocational spend from government. So even if we have more money, we can't use it. We have to give it back into the centre, and we get the allocation from the block grant. That, so all of that needs to be seen in the context of our, our government ownership. I, I guess the, the, the points that the media certainly thought about taking away, and, and, and a number of you will be, will, will be thinking about as well, is how do we make sure that we can take the, the broken funding model and repair that or find a different way to do that uh, in, in the immediate years that are ahead of us now for PC21, so that we can continue to provide the, the investment need particularly, so that we can put the services in place and that we can make sure that Northern Ireland's citizens and businesses can enjoy a world-class service and that it doesn't deteriorate to the point that we start to get regression that the system starts to break down. And Sarah, you, you, Sarah has talked about drains and cranes. Um, we firmly believe if we want to see those cranes up there developing and building and houses and so forth and, 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 and hotels and anything, anything else we need, schools and hospitals, we need to have the drainage infrastructure in place and we need to make sure that that drainage structure, uh, infrastructure is then funded so it can be operated in an efficient and effective modern 21st century uh, way. The, the last piece, the green economic recovery. We firmly believe we have a role to play in that in supporting this wider societal shift to, to a decarbonise and net zero carbon economy. And we, we know that we can, we can look at how we use electricity, we, know we, we can look at how we, 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 we can store energy and so on. We have a successful solar farm built up at uh, Denor Point, up at Antrim. And that scheme was done a number of years ago, and, and that part our, our largest water treatment works. That was something that we did, and it was that we, we were given a green light to go ahead and do that, and it's worked. It's been successful. We're looking closely at, 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 at hydrogen and uh, electrolysis at the moment, and I think there's definitely something in that. And I think that will bring a number of functions together, a number of departments together. We think there's, a, there's an interesting possible pilot there that we should, in Northern Ireland, get after, because I think it's part of the way forward for, for, for you know for our society here as well. And we've talked about the environment itself, so the peat bogs, and looking after the ground that we have responsibility for, making sure we're, our stewardship of that is responsible, and we're, we're, we're pitting back more than we take out effectively. So we think there's a, there's a big piece there that we can do with, with that. So I think that takes us to the end of the, the, the presentation. Please, we can hand off to okay, thank you. questions. Thank you very much. We've only got about 30 minutes of questions, so they'll probably be quick fire ones. So, um, but first of all, can I pass on to my gratitude and the gratitude of the committee to um, frontline staff for um, the tremendous effort that they put in um, during COVID and, and no doubt will continue to do so in, in, the, in, in the months ahead. Um, obviously, um, COVID had an incredible impact on, on the business. Um, you, you mentioned, obviously, UV800 um, 
folk working from home, which and again was, was probably quite difficult to do, but you were able to manage in a very short period of time. Um, and also there's obviously been a significant shortfall in your income and, and the committee has been aware of that. Would you be able to give us an, a, a current update as to where that is and obviously how that came about? Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to go ahead? Um, I suppose, so in the first instance, whenever lockdown came, everybody got sent home. Well, when you all got sent home, you used the water at home that would have been used here and in all your places of work. It was great weather and people took to gardening and other activities. And so the demand for water hugely increased during the, and, and was necessary for hand washing and for hygiene. But the demand for water hugely increased as soon as people uh, lockdown began. And it continued for quite a number of months at that very high level. Um, and what happened then is that water was being used in the domestic setting and not in the um, commercial setting. So we had additional costs in terms of producing the water, um, but the revenue that we get in had reduced significantly because all the businesses were closed. So therefore there was no revenue coming from businesses. And that gap between the amount of uh, revenue that we would have expected was significant, so it was over £22 million of a gap, um, but yet there was no cut in our running costs. So it's not like we were a cafe that had closed and therefore had no running costs. Our running costs were the same. In fact, they were higher because we were producing more water, and actually the business of working during COVID had got more expensive because we had to make sure everybody had the proper PPE and actually how you work then has to be different because you have to space out and things take longer. People were working, um, our frontline staff to be fair to them, were working in different shifts to make sure that they could stay socially distanced. Um, so all in all, our costs increased and our revenue decreased and that created a significant gap <coughs> for which um, the burden of funding had to fall with the shareholder, um, and it took that, that became apparent. And uh, from right from the outset, from from April, we were able to articulate our forecast of what that would be, um, and uh, to, uh, it looked in April we articulated our forecast of what that would be. It was August before. Um, we got confirmation of how much of that gap would be funded. Um, so the the bulk of the gap has been funded, and the um, deficit now, or the gap, remains at just over £2 million. So there is just over £2 million of our running costs that we are forecasting we will incur to, towards the end of the, you know, in the full year, that we don't have um, guaranteed funding for, and we're making a bid through the next monitoring round for that funding. I don't know, Roland, if there's anything. No, I think that's, that's and have you seen a change now in usage as, as people have started to go back to work, and, and is that starting to have an impact? So you, well, actually, you know, I would have to say anecdotally, it's always interesting. Weather is the biggest um, impact on water usage. So whenever the sun went away and the rain started, obviously the rain started, so that stopped all the gardens and hoses, and um, demand has significantly reduced. So we are back down to probably normal levels of demand. But equally, that shift of where that demand is coming from won't have changed. And, and we see that the that intervention by the shareholder was significant in this year, but it will continue. And I think it will continue for the next couple of years because that pattern of, um, pattern of working has changed. Even big corporates now are going to have um, maybe people working at home two or three days a week from here on in. So the amount of water that's going to get used in the home is going to increase and the amount of water that might have otherwise been traditionally used in businesses is likely to decrease and therefore the, the, there's a shift now. And so that uh, subvention or intervention by the shareholder is going to need to continue, not just for the financial year that we're in, but we see that for the next couple of years. And as a business, you indicated 800 working from home. Has that now changed from Northern Ireland Water? or? Is this a significant no, we're still, so our, our approach, I suppose, we're very much following government guidance, which has said if you can work from home, do work from home. Um, we have been hugely effective and efficient at working from home, um, which <coughs> was a very pleasant, um, I wouldn't like to say surprise, but I, you know, I'm very, very impressed at how well we have managed. So our offices, we're going through a programme of making sure they are safe, um, and we will open our office space really only for collaboration type um, activity where uh, the computer, the Zoom meeting is good for task, 
but if there's something creative or strategic that needs to be done and we need to be face to face, we'll use our spaces for that. But we're still in this period continuing to um, work at home and, and supporting our staff, I guess, as well, because schools have really only just gone back and people needed to be able to uh, manage that sort of home life balance as well. Okay, I had a number of questions, but I'm, I'm kind of conscious of my own advice and then to everyone else. So I just want to ask you, just in relation to um, the, uh, the areas where and development has been constrained as a consequence of underinvestment, um, <coughs> has there been a piece of work been carried out in relation to the opportunity cost of not having that investment? Obviously, we're aware that it's going to be £2 billion pounds is required in order to address the concerns that you have. But there has been a cost, obviously, from the lack of investment. Has there been any work done in relation to that? There has been, and, and it's been, some has been carried out outside of Northern Ireland water, so it's, it's, it's independent, which, which is good. And I think some of the, maybe possibly the Institute of Civil Engineering and others have looked at that. I think Ulster University has looked at it. And, and they're looking at, for, 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 for you know, if there's a deficit in, in investment in the infrastructure, the, the current building programme across Northern Ireland is measured in the billions. So if some of that can't go ahead, you're talking about pent-up demand, and, and, and you talk about jobs at the end of that, that, that several billions of pounds of, of, of um, development won't go ahead in, you know, over the coming three to five to six years. Um, and it's always an immediate effect. So we, we were talking to a number of, of developers and a number of different organisations, and we spent some time with uh, an organisation, you know, some of the housing associations recently, who are building, you know, they're building public housing stock and so on, which there's a demand for across the province. Uh, we were talking to one of those recently who's f finishing a, a development up in West Belfast, and they have they have aspirations to build other sites. But if the drainage isn't there, they can't go ahead with those. So that's holding up investment, and it's also holding up very much needed housing for for people, for families, for, for everyday life. But the programme is, chair, is um, we, we can come back with a number, but there is it's measured in the billions of pounds of, of investment. Okay, and obviously you refer to a, the broken model. Have you got a preferred model that, of funding? Our approach to that is. It might be simplistic, but we, 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 we would share this with the committee. The, the, the first principle, I suppose, is so the, 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 the decision in Northern Ireland is that we will, we will build non-domestics for the service, so that's businesses, and um, we won't build domestic for, for businesses, uh, for, for the use of the services. <coughs> so at, at home, we won't receive the bills. That's the decision that's been taken by the Assembly Executive, and that's the current uh, status and so on. And so we, we go with that. You know, we, we, we respect that and we understand that, and we, we implement for that. Part of that kind of, I guess, um, contract with customers that, uh, that has been set out you know, since 2007 is that customers can continue to enjoy a good uh, service, you know, level of service and, and a, a growing and improving level of service. I guess the piece that's probably maybe less transparent for customers today is as, as this um, investment deficit grows and as this backlog of things that need to be done, particularly in drainage, but not just isolated drainage, as that deficit of investment grows, Customers will start to see interruptions to the service, so we, we, we won't be able to maybe invest as much as, as, much as we would like to do in, in leakage, in, in real world class service, so customers never go out of supply. Um, we may not be able to fix everything that, that should be fixed in the network. We may be not, not be able to maintain the, the huge asset base in the way that, that any of us would, you would think of that when you maintain your car, you keep your car roadworthy so that it doesn't break down, so you can rely on it to get you from A to B. So I think, I think that. That at the moment is probably less transparent to, to lots of us in Northern Ireland that actually the service is at risk and is beginning to regress and the infrastructure is getting to a point that there, may, there, there are starting to be indicators around its serviceability. And I think that's going to impact customers more in, in, in the coming, you know, in, in, in the very near term coming years. Not, not many, many years away, but in the near term. In PC21, if the investments aren't made, we won't be able to do the things that customers rely on every day. And we certainly won't be able to build out the things that should f future proof basic services like water and wastewater, which are, are fund fundamental for everyday life. So I think, I think that is, is you know, what we say in terms of a funding model is if we're not going to you know, uh, build the domestic home, what we have to find a way, what, 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 what we would ask the executive and the assembly to find a way is to say, well, how do you make sure the investment goes in, particularly on that capital and operational programme every day and every year, because that's what's needed. So we have to find a way to unlock the constraint, on the, particularly on the capital funding, so we can go from about 900 million of funding in the current PC15 capital programme to this 2, point, you know, 2 to 2.5 billion pound for PC21. Thank you, Mr. Hilditch. 
Thanks, Chairman. Folks, you're very welcome this morning. Uh, I had the opportunity, of course, to accompany the, the Chair to a previous briefing, so a lot of my questions have been answered in the previous time. Uh, but I could have thanked the staff as well, not just for the pandemic, but the recent flooding. Uh, staff were on the ground helping out at that particular time, along with other agencies, and uh, met many of them very much appreciate what, what they were doing. <coughs> Uh, looking at the, uh, as we put to me by some folk, and I have to say it's coming from local government in relation to the figures for the economic constraint areas and serious development restriction areas, the figures keep going up and going up and adding to the capacities. But it's been pointed out that there's been a number of large users gone away, for instance, uh, closures, uh, areas of housing have disappeared. It doesn't seem the reductions are taken into consideration. It's been I've been told they're not. No, there's dynamic modelling actually. So um, again, tribute to the the staff that we have working for us. We have now pulled together computer models that take our network. They take planning applications. Um, and they take information from the councils and they bring it all together along with our future investment programme. And by running that model um, and information from the drainage area studies that we do. So the drainage area studies are the things that we'd pick up where if something had closed down um, or uh, or something else had come in. And, and quite often something closes down, but something takes its place. I don't want to be parochial, but certainly in, in the Middle East and there's a lot, a lot of closures. Um, and I know in, in Larne in particular, the high rise flats and various things like that have all gone, but Larne Town Centre keeps going up and up and up. Yeah, and no, so I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, I'm quite you can okay see with Larne. Yeah. And um, our, I have spoken to our planners in relation to the, the Larne building. And so, I'm, I, you know, we're very happy to, to pick up with that. And in fact, we are picking it up directly with the council. Um, there has been investment come into Larne in terms of some of the pharmaceutical uh, companies that have. Mm -hmm. Uh, set up there, um, and it is a very constrained network. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Boylan. Thanks, Chair. I'll, I'll a few questions, but I'll try and correlate them all together. And one, um, just you mentioned, there, obviously, we faced challenges in June. I mean, we, the one good thing about COVID was that the, the weather was very good for people. You know, I mean, it, had, it could have been a lot worse. It would have been good for any. If it was raining all the time, but it certainly had people through that first early phase. It was very, very difficult for people. But see, just to cross over the thing, see the way a lot of people were at home. I know they were using the hoses, they were washing the cars and everything else. But if you look at that, the types of businesses, the car wash business and everything else, did you ever cross tie that to balance in terms of the usage? You know the what I mean? Demand is significantly increased. Right. So we were seeing upwards of so you'll see in all our publications on average we supply 570 million liters of water a day it was never falling below 600 million mm. liters of water a day and it was going up every single day so you would look and go it's now at 610 it surely can't go any higher it was getting higher and higher and higher and the people it, you know who were trying to keep the water treatment plants running were saying we really need a hosepipe ban. People need to stop wasting water. People were wasting water. And I guess I would just say to everyone, think about a bottle of drinking water. Would you open hundreds of them and walk about your garden, sprinkling them? Because that's what people were doing with hoses. Hoses were running all night. So there was significant amounts of tap water, drinking water, wasted. Grass goes brown, grass turns green. Yeah. So in terms of 150 litres, what roughly does it go up to? You're saying 150 litres in your per day. What per, does it go up to? It, it could have been higher than as high as 200. Okay. So just two, my two main questions. One is the the you mentioned the 600 million treasury loan issue <coughs> at one of the briefings before. The 600 million treasury loan note that you're in, you know. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. current uh, the current uh, loan. Yeah, in, in terms of was this used during the lockdown? And I want to just cross that over with. Um, how does that focus then, or how does it cross tie with the Irish water system? I mean, just give me an idea how that would work as a model. Now. And, and the other one is just because I know my other members want again. Um, you're saying there about the 25 percent in your report about um, reducing the, the drinking water, but you mentioned down by 40 percent in your report there, sir. How, how do we get down to that in terms of, you know, 
like I'm thinking about working with the Department of Communities in terms of, of the, you know, overall social housing or whatever type of housing development it is. If we're serious about getting down to that 40% or you mentioned 25% in your report, just a wee bit in relation to how how the overall target is in relation to that, how we get there. So if we pick up first, um, uh, Mr. Boyle, on on the the loan question, yeah. yeah. So so we we have a number of, of loan arrangements, and they're laid out in the annual report and accounts. You can see those on our on our website, and th- we have a we have a loan note arrangement in place at the moment, and we were able to access that during COVID, where we needed to to make sure we had working capital and so forth. So what, pretty while we're waiting for our budget to be signed off, note that we were looking at our cash situation, making sure that that, that was that was still healthy and and. Importantly for us, one of, the, one of the key principles about sending all the team home to work from home is could we function normally? Could we pay all our supplier bills in Northern Ireland? So all the companies who work for us and all the people who supply us and kept us supply during COVID, we couldn't say to them, look, we'll be, back in, we'll be back in August, fingers crossed, we'll be back in August. Can you keep supplying us, but wait until then, until we, we, can, we can pay your bills then? So first principles are our finance team or our accounts payable team um, they kept everyone. They, they kept bills processed and paid, and so suppliers were, very, were, were getting good confidence from that. They could carry on working for Northern Ireland Water, knowing their, their their bills were going to be paid, and they could carry on then paying their staff if they hadn't put teams on furlough and so on. So we were able to access working capital, and we were able to use the loan note where it was necessary to do so. And that was that, that, that's a positive. That's that's, what, that's why it's important to have that in place. And and I guess any organisation should have a sort of series of tiers on its finance that it can it can access in an emergency. Um, the, the, so that, that's the first point on that piece. In terms of Irish water and how they're structured and, and so on, there are similarities, but I think in, 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 in the last sort of couple of years, Irish water have been able to go to the markets, you know, to the money markets. And as you know, um, the, the money markets have been, you, you can access you know, loan notes and finance quite inexpensively on the, on the markets at the moment. Um, and I think they were able to raise bond finance to fund some of these things, uh, in, as opposed to everything coming through central government. So there, there, is a, there are some differences in the model there, and there are probably some differences in the model with Scottish water as well. So those are things that when we look at how do you finance and fund Northern Ireland water going forward, those things have been looked at in the past. We could come back around those things with, with uh, the department and others, and then it, it could be decided, well, can, can we actually put some flexibility into the model that way and do some of those things? I have to say the department worked well with us during COVID. They were waiting for the, the confirmation on the budget, but they knew the issues and, and they knew the constraints we were under, and we were working very closely with the team of the department. So I think this is this, the, your question on the funding comes back to the funding model, the question that the chair asked there, and it's what is the best way to fund this essential service, both in its day-to-day operating costs and in its, in its six-year finance programmes for building out its, its, its capital investment programmes. And I think that particularly that capital investment programme piece that's the piece that has to be examined as a matter of urgency, because when we get into PC21 in a few months' time, next April, we really need to hit the ground running and build out this six-year programme <coughs> so Northern Ireland doesn't... Firstly, we don't add more towns to the, the constrained areas, and we, we improve the picture for places like Lauren and other places, and, and that we, we make sure the service doesn't fall into regression and, and interruption and customers don't enjoy a, what should be a world-class service, I think. Northern Ireland people should enjoy and should, should have available to them a world-class water and wastewater programme. So I think, I think all of that is what we're advocating is explored as a matter of importance and urgency around what's the best way for Northern Ireland to finance its, its water, wastewater, operating and capital programmes. And the better designed houses and the reduction? That, that's part of it. If, if, again, if, if, if we were looking at you know, the, 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 the building controls and regulations around, around how does water get used, You'd build those into, uh, you know, the next series of housing stock that's being built in Northern Ireland, and I think that would take changes in legislation and so forth. But I know that even in, 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 in speaking to some of the developers and some of the, the housing associations, they're keen to be world class. They're keen to make sure that their homes are, are not energy, you know, are, are energy efficient. And part of being energy efficient is that you're not the home's designed in such a way that it's it's using water to the best effect. And, and, and they're not just energy efficient homes, but they're water efficient homes, and that, that helps back to that zero carbon piece as well. So we know there's an appetite to do that in, in some of the developers and some of those housing associations, and we're looking at proposals to be, to be part of maybe designing a, a kind of house of the future in, in association with a number of other stakeholders. But a huge part of that's our own behaviour, you know, and, and, and it's all of us, and uh, it's all of who we talk to. Even in the even in the building stock that we have, I agree we absolutely should change the building stock. But there's a lot of existing stock, 
and if we're running taps for um, cleaning vegetables there's loads and loads of things running hoses in gardens running hoses when we're washing cars there's lots and lots of small steps that we can all take and we have to be <coughs> willing to there's there's a lot of reticence to do that okay mr okay. buchanan thank you just to follow on sarah and uh, ronan yeah. on that point where does that 150 litres a day, the average figure, need to be to have a massive impact on that 2 billion figure? For example, does that need to turn into 80? You can't. It wouldn't matter if you turned it off. Or, well, if you turned it off, you'd have no sewage. But that's, <laughs> you know, you have, we're humans. We have waste. We have a sewage system. So uh, the water efficiency piece is about creating resilience and about ha stopping from having to build lots and lots of new infrastructure. But the two billion, if you think about the two billion that we need to spend, mm -hmm. almost half of it is on your wastewater infrastructure. That needs to be spent. And that level of investment in wastewater infrastructure needs to continue over at least another three Jeez, price controls. That two billion you're saying, sir, needs to be spent irrelevant of what you push that 150 down by. Can you you can reduce it, I presume, by a figure if you reduce your output. Well, you can prevent you probably prevent having to you still have to maintain all your water treatment works. Yeah. You still need all the pipes to get to your house. Um, you still need all the surface reservoirs between the water treatment works and your house to store the water. You you prevent your you prevent uh, when the um, it gets very cold or it gets very hot and you all start to use more water. You prevent supply interruptions, you prevent water from running out by driving that number down. The, uh, across the industry, there is a really ambitious target to get it down to 100 litres of water per person per day. Um, and that, So we're a big outlier in Northern Ireland in our water use. What, what do you spend roughly per year on education of people, whether it be burst pipes, you know, you know the TV adverts you do, what do you spend roughly per year and do you see a benefit in doing that? No, I mean a financial benefit. We see, we see a payback. We do, we do. Yeah. But what we, what we find, and especially if you think about, um, we would, uh, it costs, what is it, about two, about two million pounds a year to deal with sewer blockages. So sometimes we run campaigns about what not to put down the sewers. When we do that in an area, and I think we went into Carrick Fergus one time and into some of the estates, um, and we've seen immediate success and savings in relation to the amount of blockages. But when we left that area, the behaviour came back again. So it's kind of a constant drip is, is required. Um, and how much do we spend on campaigns is in the low, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe a couple of hundred thousand a year is, is tops the amount of money that we have for our various campaigns. Frank, frankly, the, the number we spend at the moment um, isn't sufficient to really push the message out and, and to get um, all of us thinking differently about it. I mean, it, it isn't in anywhere near what is spent in water companies in England and Wales or even in, the, in, 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 in Irish water. The, their campaign is much more concerted, it's much more strongly funded, because it, it's that through those kinds of campaigns and community-based campaigns like the, the interventions in Carrick Fergus, that's when you, you really get people to think about it differently in a sustained way so that, that eventually you change the behaviours, not just in the immediate term, but actually people do it differently ongoing. And I, I think we're probably at the... At, at the beginning edges of some of that, based on the amount of money we can spend on that, because the, the, the amount of money is, is constrained again and is limited, we would need to spend. Invest, I, I wouldn't call it spend; I call it investing yeah. more um, to help people think about about that difference. Final quick question, Chair: Regarding the 800 workers you refer to working at home currently, sir, <coughs> I don't know what the word you use. You're surprised or delighted at the way it all worked out. What do you see with those 800 going forward? Do you see them all coming back? Do you see a majority? Well, we've 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 surveyed them, and and um, I think eighty percent of people have said to us they would like some flexibility, so that they would like a balance. They would like so uh, people miss uh, camaraderie, they miss the collegiate mm. nature of working together, mm. and they want to retain that, um, but also have some flexibility. And we think that that's what will happen in the future. Um, uh, the, the workplace of the future will have that balance of task can be done at home um, and collaboration will be done together and our spaces will need to change to reflect uh, that changing nature of, of how we're working and how we're working internally um, and our technology then will also have to support that 
sort of mixed economy of some of us might be in, a, in, a, in the home setting, whereas others in the office setting, and we still need to be able to communicate. But uh, yes, we see that happening. And we're working towards now as we bring people back, doing that with the kind of end in mind, uh, so that um, as we set up our structures, that uh, we can um, make that happen. So in the in the first instance, it's all kind of about distance, isn't it? And yeah, keep yeah. people remotely safe. But the distance hopefully will change, um, and will and, and you probably need less of a footprint. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Sarah Ronan. Good to see you again. Um, given that there's one certainty that you know that there will be no domestic water charges uh, for as long as Sinn Féin has got the power here in the, in the executive that we have. And that's a certainty, and you know that. So given that you said, Ronan, the question is, what is the best way to fund? And you talked about what happened with Irish Water and the, 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 bon the bonds facility that, that has been in place and that they are failing of. Has your minister, along with yourself, sat down and actually unpacked those options to look at the kind of borrowing that would be or could be available to you so that we can address the massive issues and problems that you have put before us today? So, so over the years, a number of ministers from different parties have looked at that, and certainly the department and ourselves have, have looked at that closely. And um, I know that our own minister currently has um, brought together a, a, a panel, an advisory panel, to assess what is the best way to, to look at infrastructure in all its complexity in Northern Ireland. We probably think that is a positive thing that she is looking at. That is a good thing that she has asked a, a group of people outside of her immediate remit within the department to take a look at that. So, um, Kirsty McManus is, is from, from um, IOD is currently heading up that panel. And, um, you know, we look forward to seeing an outcome from that, that, that panel and that report to assess what is the best way forward. Within that, then, within Northern Ireland, because that, that report will probably consider both the public infrastructure that we have, such as Northern Ireland Water and the roads and so on, as well as private infrastructure through the, the power companies and so I, forth. I don't want to interrupt you, Ronan, but I am particularly keen, if you are saying that other ministers and yourselves in the past, and this minister with yourself, is currently looking at potential funding models now. Could we, as a committee, get the information of the kind of options that you are considering that does not take account of the one conversation that sometimes can be presented to us as the only option is domestic charges, water charges? I would like to see the options with that not on the table or it a option, but the other options that are being pursued. And that's the kind of, I think, information that I would appreciate as chair of this committee to understand the actual work that has been done by the department and what option papers you are maybe intending to or have already brought to your minister. So there's, there's, a, question there, there's a question there for the department to, to share what information they have, and certainly we, we would have no issue sharing whatever any information that we've looked at and okay. options we've looked at that. across the years. And I suppose, and to, to, to build on the question. The key constraint currently is that Northern Ireland Water is predominantly funded from the block grant, and the block grant is the key constraint. So we get we get a resource Dale allocation of money to run our business every day, and we get uh, a capital Dale allocation that that then allows us to go off and build out a capital investment program. Um, if, if I look at the capital piece at the moment, the 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 constraint in that currently, the 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 the, the amount of capital available through the block grant currently to Northern Ireland Water is not sufficient to build out what is in the PC21 business plan. That is that's that's clear. So that, the, the most immediate and effective way to look at that is to examine what can be done to take away that constraint, whether that constraint is an artificial constraint or a very real constraint because of the size and shape of the block grant. The key piece of work, not for the department and for ourselves and for the Department of Finance and I guess for the Assembly Executive, is to say what can be done to examine that constraint factor on the capital Dale allocation and to remove it and maybe to put Northern Ireland Water's capital plan into a ring-fenced allocation of capital that, that cannot be taken away to go off and do all the things with. But you say, there's your ring-fenced allocation. I, I use that, use that to build the programme. I appreciate, look, there's a wider issue for the executive, whatever. But the one thing I want to ask you about, I would like to draw your attention to the members to page uh, 643. And it outlines the constrained the areas that are constrained, the economic constrained areas, the serious development restrictions, and the PC21 investment. And I have to say, I am absolutely appalled to see that the one area that there's a gaping hole, not a green dot, 
Kerry, Japan, or Oma in, in relation to the planned PC21 investment. When I look at all the other areas where the, where the green dots is, and Sarah, I've raised this with you before, uh, in relation to area of, uh, in, in relation to Derry and Japan and Oma. Of course, if there is uh, no drains, there's no cranes. And therefore, I am concerned that given the Minister has already told me that NI Water has advised her that it has been indicated that there's eight projects for the dairy area in its business plan for the period 21 to 27. So I'm just trying to marry that. And she says these eight projects would cost 31.25 million. But I just think when I look at that, um, and all the investment that is going in, and rightly so, these areas need uh, investment. Then, when I look at where Derry and Stravan and Oma resides in the PC21 plan, I'm alarmed in the context of trying to tackle regional inequalities. And I think the alarm and the ask that needs to come from this committee outwards is there has been generational underinvestment in wastewater. And because it has happened, uh, it takes a lot of money to fix it. Absolutely. So the ask for two billion will fix the places that have the green dots. So where you see Straban perhaps still in red or a lighter shade of red, thirty million pounds worth of work will be completed. That will provide some ease, but it won't take all the constraints away. Further investment is needed. So the time is now to say this is important to Northern Ireland. This money must be found. And if I'm honest, I'm coming here nearly 10 years. Somebody sent me a text this morning to say there's an article in the newspaper this morning, and they said, you know what, that's the same thing that's been said for 10 years. So the actual ask from me actually round to the committee is, let's not let this be the same in 10 years hence. And, and um, the ask isn't necessarily of me to come up with the solution. We are a publicly funded water company. We sit under the remit of the Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly. Um, we do an excellent job. We're very efficient. We can deliver the, uh, the investment and in infrastructure. We need the funding. We're not asking for charging. We're asking for funding. And that goes back to my earlier question about the options that I think members would appreciate being bought for because I know you, you asked for 150 million <coughs> this year and you got your bid in full and we also know that the department has for the first time got a 20 per cent increase and it's 558 million that has gone into the department for capital and other funding so we know that the funding in the department has demonstrated that it is at least in some ways acknowledging that it has had a 20 percent increase the highest ever increase it has got but we know you've got your bid in full for this year but, remember, but i'm still concerned uh, the 150 million year. is a course, constrained bid of course 150 million is a portion of 900 million uh, that was, should have been 1.7 so. billion so we should take no pleasure or no win from the fact that there's 150 million has been allocated no, to bid, water. We allocated. should hang our heads in shame <laughs> and say we are not spending enough money on our wastewater infrastructure. And look, we appreciate that, and it goes back to the earlier point, Chair, that we need to know the options. Not having a circular conversation, but what options are there available so that we can look at bond financing or any other financing that is available to yourselves in order that we can fix these problems and it would be good for this committee to be informed at the kind of conversations and the options that are being put either by yourself and others who are involved in this conversation in consultation and discussion with the members. And, and, and that, that, just, if I could just add one thing, I, mean, I think the key thing there is that would not just be for the Department for Infrastructure and ourselves, we would welcome we would welcome direct access to Department of Finance officials that we can interact directly with the senior people at DOF to open up the possibilities. If there's, I'm very mindful that we are now technically over our time, so we will be rushed to the last. There's four more um, members who have indicated, so just be very, very mindful of that. In order to move that forward, obviously we have the minister here next week, so these are questions perhaps that we could put directly to her. Okay. Okay. So, Mrs. Kelly. Thanks, Chair, and apologies for my late arrival. I had an earlier appointment, um, but really to pick up on um, the behaviour of households. You know, and I just wonder, in other jurisdictions, uh, how do the usage from on a household, um, 
How does it compare? Is, is one question, particularly where there are uh, water charges. Um, our parties opposed to water charges. I believe all exec it was an executive decision not to introduce water charges, but there is an inescapable fact: we need to invest in our water, and uh, I think that's something that the executive will have to recognise uh, uh, moving forward if we are to drive the economy forward and, and all of the hold-ups. But uh, uh, one of the my understanding is. The UK Internal Market Bill, I mean, many people are focusing on the issues around borders, what have you, but actually taking sweeping powers. So we could be, uh, with, with the devolution powers that, um, they're, that are, they're seeking to undermine, they actually the British government, should the bill go ahead, actually take onto themselves the power to introduce water charges. I think that's a cautionary tale for those who persist in uh, supporting at Westminster. Uh, the UK Internal Market Bill. But aside from all of that, I'm very interested to know how we change behaviour because it appalls me, you know, it's a bit like, you know, the recycling. It appalls me the, the cavalier attitude that many individuals have uh, towards uh, our natural resources and particularly water. So, how, how is, and it's, it is a long term behavioural cultural change, but uh, and many people talk about the carrot and stick approach. I just wonder elsewhere um, how, how do we compare? So, well, we, we compare poorly, um, and, and part of we, we talk to the other water companies, and, and some of the positive measures um, they talk about um, nudging and behavioural shift. Yeah. So, um, and, and feeling ownership. So, uh, in the south of England, they're obviously very uh, constrained for water resources, and, and the weather's a lot warmer. Um, but they had carried out experiments with people where, on one half, they said, "Look, see if water it's a good thing to do," mm -hmm. and then another group of people they said, "Your water comes from the um, Silent Valley R Reservoir. This, the people of Newcastle uh, need to conserve water by X amount so that there is water for Newcastle." Mm -hmm. Those campaigns work better. So when you feel ownership, that works better. But the other bit that it has to be said is, you know, we all know the old saying, what gets measured gets done. So nobody knows. You don't know what you're using in your house mm. because you don't measure it. There's no means of me telling you you used uh, 200 litres yesterday per person. So 800 litres in a, you know, a family of four. So there's something there about measurement as well. And, and then it's, look, it is a big conversation. It's a societal conversation. To be fair, a um, number of years ago, we didn't segregate our waste. We didn't put food waste mm -hmm. in a different bin. We didn't put cardboard in a different bin. You know, it's a, it's a hanging offence in our house if somebody goes to the wrong yeah. bin. That has happened through um, you know, general education and societal education. So I think it can be done. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Just two quick questions. First of all, as a result of the restrictions on uh, developments, and I think there's going to be difficult decisions that have to be made by politicians in Northern Ireland to ensure that that investment occurs, and that is going to be people are going to have to step up for that. Um, as a result of that, a lot of people are installing their own within developments, their own septic tanks and stuff like that. It's funny you're commenting yourself on the potential environmental consequences about that. And also, um, the issue of Brexit is obviously a clear and present issue. Uh, what preparations are being done and what are the risks are in advance of the end of the transition period at the end of this year? So, in relation to um, private developers maybe taking uh, on board and putting their own wastewater solutions in place, um, the Environment Agency exists in order to ensure that the, um, what's installed is, is correct and proper and, and, and in line with what there should be for the environment. So they have a big role to play in that regard, and developers, if they want to put in their own infrastructure, do have to get permission from the Environment Agency. I don't think it's a good thing. I think it's, um, it will invariably cost taxpayers more money because eventually if we are being asked to adopt those assets all of a sudden instead of having one wastewater treatment work you have a plethora of small package type uh, works which cost more to maintain cost more to run so it's not a good idea it's not a good solution um, and we should try to avoid it we are doing a lot of work with developers to try and um, accommodate development where we can but it is very, very difficult now, and we're left with very little choices. Um, in relation to Brexit, so Brexit is something, again, that we have been planning for, that we are part of a wider um, consortium with all the water companies across the UK, um, and we have a Brexit incident management group. 
um, and we have been doing quite a bit of work around our supply chains and understanding our supply chains and ensuring that um, we uh, know uh, where we get our stuff from and, and if there are any materials that we need to maybe increase and ho have a, a greater holding of for a period of uncertainty. But I think that the main factor that we're pretty sure of is increased costs. So the, the biggest impact uh, that will likely happen is we will get access to the chemicals, we will be able to provide your water, it will cost more. Could you perhaps provide um, more information just in relation to yes. um, that particular aspect of, of the work that you've been carrying out? It might be useful for members just in further yeah. deliberations. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay. Thank you, um, Ms. Kenneth. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Sarah and Ronan. And I, th I think from our visit, it's, it's, it's good to be able to visualise a lot of what you're talking about as well, so um, that's appreciated. Look, I'm, not, I'm only good, I'll just cut to two to short questions and it's come back to the PC21 and obviously I've been harping on about it for a long time and my constituency in your arm is, is an area that, that is in great need of, of investment in the wastewater infrastructure. So it was really just to kind of get a bit of an idea, you know, at this stage have you looked at what areas will be targeted and, and I understand that it's it is likely dependent on funding um, that, that some will have to be excluded. Um, hopefully it will not be the case, but it is, it is definitely a possibility. And, and in that case, how do you decide which ones will make the cut, or are you at that point yet? Um, so as part of the PC21 business planning process, uh, there are working groups find, uh, formed, and our, uh, so in relation to that kind of prioritisation of spend, uh, the engineers in NI Water um, along with the operations people in NI Water would define all the places of need. Then the Environment Agency would sit alongside that and they would then um, define the highest priority sites from an environment perspective and the, the list then gets prioritised in relation to um, all the various demands on it. So if something is polluting a river right now, right here, right now, the Environment Agency might say, well, that's at the top of the list. It needs to stop. You need to invest to stop that. Whereas, um, if we prevent someone from uh, connecting to a sewer, then that pollution can never get into the sewer network, and it's not actually happening. So uh, that prioritised list isn't dictated by NI Water. It's done in conjunction with the environmental uh, regulator, which is NIEA, and that list then is put forward to the utility regulator, who are the financial regulator, <coughs> and what their role is, they will look and say, you said it costs 100 million to do that scheme, you know, we challenge you to do it for 95, or we accept 100 million is the cost for that. So they, they challenge all the, the costs, um, and that might uh, enable a few more schemes to get over the line, uh, and that's how your list of schemes comes about. So it's a collaboration really between um, the, what the environmental regulator dictates and demands, and a lot of that comes through legislation. So if legislation says uh, the water quality in the river must be, and the water, the, the constituent parts of your effluent coming out of a wastewater treatment works must be, then we have to invest to make that happen. Yeah, and just a, a quick point on that one. So at this point, obviously PC21, as Ronan mentioned, is only a few months away. So is there a list at present, or is it something that's still a work in progress? There's a, there's, a, there's a huge programme of work, and that has been submitted to um, the utility regulator, and they're going to give us their first view on that uh, at the end of the month. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. very conscious the Finance Committee are due to be getting here at 12.30, so... Okay. Very, very quickly. Uh, economic uh, leakage level of water is when it's good to invest public money to stop the leaks. How much money is needed to meet that requirement? Sorry, I didn't catch the last one. How much invest, capital investments needed to meet the economic leakage level? The needed. economic level of leakage. Um, we, uh, we can provide you with that number. It is a significant number. Okay. We have put it in to our PC21 business plan. So our PC21 business plan is based on meeting the economic level of leakage and, in fact, possibly even bettering it. Um, we're doing lots of work at the minute in relation to uh, how can we better utilise technology. So we're actually using satellite imagery at the minute to take pictures from space um, that give us areas where we believe there's chlorinated water and the, the leakage teams are going out to try and find leaks that way. So we're doing, as well as traditional techniques, we're using um, um, new technology and as much modern uh, assistance as we can to try and tackle that leakage problem. Then in terms of uh, 
implications for planning and, and restricted development. Is Northern Ireland Water accumulating the number of businesses that are not being given appropriate planning permissions, social housings, ordinary housing developments? Who's, who's taking the global picture of how much this is affecting our economy? So we probably have a record of those that we've. We, we're, we're a statutory consultee on planning applications, and we have a record of those that we've come back and said, "Look, we, we couldn't connect that if it's built." Mm. And then I think then the planning authorities probably have a wider connected database. And the, the question you'd asked earlier about you know the, the impact on, on, on of the constraint on the wider economy, I think there is a collective figure which we, we, we provide to the the, the um, committee in terms of how much investment is is in the pipeline for. For new development in Northern Ireland, and, and what, what the constraining factor might be as, as an impact. Can you provide us the numbers around those? Because I think it'd be interesting for people to really understand how this is affecting. And then finally, uh, in terms of your slide uh, where um, PC21 investment would occur, there's lots of green dots. How many of those green dots are actually funded at this minute in time? Are they? Is this just a aspiration? Is the money in the bag to actually do this work that's shown there? Well, that's based on the plan, um, and. The invidious position we find ourselves in is we don't know how much money we have for next year at all, so nothing, zero. Okay. Okay. And, and maybe just just thirty seconds on the process. So at the end of the month, sir, was described, and we, we give our plan to the regulator in January, and they've been evaluating that carefully and, and diligently. They'll give us a readout on what they think about the plan at the end of this month. We'll then do some work on that response and assess that response to see whether we can do it. We'll give a, we'll give a response back. That, so what they'll give us at the end of this month is known as a draft determination. We'll then reply back to that on the 10th of December. And then in, in February, March time, they'll give a final determination. And they'll say that's what they think the amount of investment required is. It's at that point that then the, the, the owner of Northern Ireland Board, the, the Assembly Executive at this stage, I guess, has to say, right, well, we need to put the money into the investment. The regulator has approved a plan. Northern Ireland Water Let's assume all everybody says we can make that plan work. We need to have the investment funds available to us, and we need to know at the beginning across six years that we have the investment money available. To us. Thank you. We've run out of time, unfortunately, so thank you very much. And apologies for the fact that it was so rushed, but we are under time constraints, as you'll appreciate. Um, but we will certainly be returning to this issue um, on a regular basis, uh, and we certainly have the utility regulator um, hopefully coming to meet with us in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just very quickly, members, then, just draw your attention to the full work programme um, and scheduled briefings until Christmas recess, so you can get to the stage with what's been outlined. Yep. Right. Thank you. And members of any other business? Chair, I understand there's a letter going from the committee. I wish to dissent. It would be recorded as dissenting in relation to the urgent oral yesterday. Okay, thank you. Um, anything further? No. Just, Chair, I think we probably need to be mindful of the fact that when we're dealing with so many SL21s, we're really going to eat into the time that we have with officials. I know it's trying to juggle how we do both, and I know it's difficult. You, you couldn't have done it any quicker today. Uh, fair play to you. You went through that excellently. But it's just something that we might have to try to see. Just if there's a way around doing something by written procedure, if there's some of them that's not controversial. I think it was just the nature of the fact that from recess that mm -hmm. we had. Yeah, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's just if we could have had more time. It wouldn't be, that wouldn't be normal. It would have been it better wouldn't, today. It wouldn't be normal. So, yeah. okay. um, so um, obviously, members just remember to maintain social distancing as you leave. Remove all your own papers, um, water bottles, glass, etc. from the meeting room. Um, our next meeting is in this place in the Senate chamber next Wednesday the 23rd of September at 10am. Um, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.